power and it was possible to leave. My mother's family was less fortunate and uh, they fled to Paris, but Paris of course didn't last long. It, uh, it fell under the Nazis and she was arrested by the Gestapo and held for the next train to the concentration camps actually, but uh, she escaped while, you know, before the train arrived. Um, and uh, they met, they both eventually made it to the United States. They met and married here. Uh, I, I, th at the time that I'm talking about of my childhood, um, the Jewish community was quite a bit more segregated from the Christian community. For instance, uh, the town in New Jersey where I grew up was the only town in the area that allowed Jews to buy houses. Um, I went to Jewish religious education alongside secular school from the beginning of schooling until university. All my friends were Jewish, all my parents' friends were Jewish, and so forth. And I took Judaism very seriously, uh, extremely seriously. I'm, I had a tremendous love of God, and I really thought that Judaism was the, the, the channel for relating to God. And um, in fact, um, uh, yeah, well, I'm trying to, okay. I'll just go with the flow. It's just it's different every time. So, in fact, um, uh, as a child growing up, I, you know, felt very strongly. I felt very strongly the presence of God, and I felt very strongly that there has to be a real meaning and purpose to life, which will come when I enter into a personal knowing relationship with God, which I uh, really thought would happen at my bar, my bar mitzvah, which is sort of parallel to the Catholic confirmation when the boy is about 13 years of age, there is a ceremonial, a ceremonial introduction into adult, adulthood as a Jew uh, in synagogue. And I really thought growing up that that's when I would come to know God personally. And when it didn't happen and the bar mitzvah was just this kind of secular celebration, it was actually one of the saddest, uh, saddest days of my childhood. Then pretty soon I decided that the real meaning and purpose of life would come when I got a driver's license. <laughs> Um, you know, or when I left home for university, or uh, when I got a girlfriend, or then after I went to MIT, after that, if I got into Harvard Business School, and then when I started my career and so forth. But here was the problem. The problem was that I did uh, well enough at Harvard Business School to be invited back to join the faculty upon graduation. So I found myself a newly minted professor of marketing at Harvard Business School at the ripe old age of 29, and that's when the bottom fell out of my world because here I was looking forward to the real meaning of purpose of life. First I thought it would come you know, from knowing God, then I thought it would come from some kind of secular success. Here I was already more successful than I had ever anticipated being, uh, but there was still no meaning or purpose to life. But at this point there was nothing more I could look forward to that I might imagine might give life its real meaning. So I actually fell into the darkest um, despair of my life at that point. And I was walk, walking um, in nature early one morning. That's the only place I could find solace. And I had long since lost my faith in God. I, I skipped that part, I'm sorry. But I lost my belief in God when I went to university. I went to MIT, which of course is a, a science, technology, university. And uh, by the time I came out of MIT, I was atheist. And I was, I had entirely, I had not only lost my belief in the existence of God, but the tragic part was I thought that I could not in good conscience believe in God because God was simply a superstition man came up with until he had science to give him the real explanations of everything. And anything that science can't explain now, it will be able to explain in five years. So although I kind of wanted to still believe in God, I didn't think it was morally permissible. Uh, pretty bizarre, but that's what I thought. So anyway, so I was an atheist and, and then Harvard Business School and then the success. And so I was walking in nature early one morning having lost any belief in God or any hope that God might exist when I received the most spectacular grace of my life. I was just walking alone in nature when from one moment to the next, the uh, curtain between the physical world and the spiritual world disappeared and I found myself looking into the spiritual world. Um, and I wasn't surprised that I could see into the spiritual world at all. The only thing that surprised me was that I could ever have been blind to it and ever not seen it because it was so much more real and more concrete and more immediate than the physical world 
that I could not comprehend how I could ever have been blind to it, and I could literally could not imagine ever again not seeing it. But that wasn't the really big part of this experience. The really big part of this experience was I found myself in the very immediate, I can say immediate presence of God, but it's not, that's not really capturing it. I found myself in a state of total, total communication with God, uh, total awareness of his presence, total exchange, in some sense, exchange of thoughts, um, and a, a total experience of his love. I mean, a very immediate experience of his love. And I saw in this experience, uh, as soon as it happened, I saw my life, I understood my life as though I was looking back over my life in the presence of God after death. And I saw that my two greatest regrets when I died would be, number one, all of the time and energy I had worried about not being loved, when every moment of my existence I was held in an ocean of love greater than I ever imagined could exist coming from this all-knowing, all-loving God. And the other great regret would be every hour I had wasted doing nothing of value in the eyes of heaven. Um, now, I, I'm going to say a lot of what I saw in this experience. We know them as the truths of the Catholic faith, but they were completely, completely new concepts to me. Uh, they were not something that was present in Judaism. So that's just a little backdrop, because you might say, well, we all know that, we all know that. This stuff I knew nothing, uh, I knew none of. So first of all, I saw that we live forever. That was news to me. I saw that we live forever. I saw that every action had a moral content that is observed and weighed in the balance and recorded for all eternity. I saw that every time we take advantage of an opportunity to do something of value in the eyes of heaven, we will be rewarded for it for all eternity. That every opportunity we let go by and don't take advantage of will be a lost opportunity for all eternity. I saw how foolish I had been. I had kind of lived my life looking in the rearview mirror, saying to myself, oh, if only that hadn't happened, then I would be happy today or if only that hadn't happened, then I would be happy today, when um, nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, everything that had ever happened to me had been the most perfect thing that could be arranged coming from the hands of an all-knowing, all-loving God, not only including those things that had caused the most suffering at the time, but especially those things that had caused the most suffering at the time. And um, the, uh, I'm, uh, okay. I'm sorry, I'm being too self-referential, but it's very interesting to me what's going on because you know, I was worried about not being able to do justice to the two topics, and the Holy Spirit keeps shutting me up and not having me say what I normally say at this point. <laughs> so I think it's being well managed. But anyway, um, the, by far the biggest, most transformative aspect of this experience was coming in to the knowledge and the direct experience that God himself, the God who not only created everything that exists, but literally created existence itself, or at least contingent existence itself, not only knew me by name, which had never occurred to me as a Jew, not only knew me by name, not only had been arranging absolutely everything that had ever happened to me, but had been watching over me, doting on me, caring about me, as though I was the only creature he had ever created, and as though, in a very real way, everything that made me happy made him happy, and everything that made me sad made him sad. The image I had was of the most doting grandfather you could imagine, leaning over his, his first-born grandchild, you know, with his ear to the infant's lips just to, you know, hear any murmuring coming from him. And uh, coming into that awareness just absolutely changed everything. Um, there, everything I had worried about all my life was nonsense. I mean, there was no, no reason to be anxious about anything, that everything was being taken care of by the creator of the universe in this incredibly personal, relating to me way, caring, about, knowing how I felt at every instant of my existence and caring about how I felt and so forth. Um, everything changed. And of course, the purpose and meaning of my life. I had been so worried that life had no meaning or purpose, but okay, now I'm gonna apologize for myself a little bit. I was a professor of marketing at Harvard Business School. So if I, was, if I had a totally selfish attitude in those days, 
I will claim that as a defense because, I mean, what's, Harvard Business School is a graduate training in selfishness, right? So, <laughs> and, 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 and I had this experience, but the conversion of heart, you know, is, is a slower process. So I, had been, I saw all of this, but I still kind of interpreted it in a selfish way. So I, I, what I saw wasn't that it was wrong to be selfish. What I saw was that I had been stupidly selfish. And if I wanted to be smart and selfish, the only thing that made sense was to try to be as great a saint as possible and do as much for God as possible. Right? It was like I had this image. Uh, I, it was like I was a small child playing Monopoly, greedily accumulating this brightly colored, meaningless Monopoly money when I was ignoring this huge stack of solid gold coins right next to it. So anyway, I went back to um, Cambridge, Massachusetts, where I live. If that's where uh, Harvard is, um, happier than I had ever been. I knew it was all true. I knew we live forever. I knew that there was no meaning to be anxious about anything. But what I didn't know was who this God was and what religion to follow. In fact, during that experience, during this state of consciousness, uh, this union, I don't know what to call it, but this, this uh, the, the, well, anyway, I, I just don't know any I, revelation, but anyway, this kind of, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll borrow a theological term from Star Trek, mind meld. That's really what it felt like. So during this mind meld with God, um, I wanted to know his name, and I prayed on the spot, let me know your name so I know what religion to follow to worship and serve you properly. I don't mind if you're Buddha and I have to become Buddhist. I don't mind if you're Krishna and I have to become Hindu. I don't mind if you're Apollo and I have to become a Roman pagan, as long as you're not Christ and I have to become Christian. <laughs> um, and I very literally prayed that and he didn't reveal his name to me. I obviously wasn't ready to hear it. But anyway, once I got back home, um, I lost all interest in teaching Harvard MBAs how to make a little more money. All I wanted to do was work on my heavenly bank account, so to speak, um, and find out who this God was and what religion to follow and so forth. So and I didn't really have a very good place to turn, and I wasted some time in some foolish paths. But I did one not foolish thing, which is every night before going to sleep, I would say a short prayer that I had made up to know the name of my Lord and God and Master who had revealed himself to me in that experience. And a year to the day after that first experience, and I know it was a year to the day because, um, well, for one thing, because I was journaling, but also because I had um, said a prayer before going to sleep also of thanksgiving for what had happened a year earlier. So I went to sleep, and I thought I was woken by a hand on my shoulder and led to a room and left alone with the most beautiful young woman I could ever imagine. And I knew without being told that it was the Blessed Virgin Mary. Now. I have to say that now, of course, I understand that I, my body was asleep in bed, and if there had been a camera in a room, it would have shown me asleep in bed. But I, um, at the time, I thought I was entirely awake. Uh, my experience, my memory represents it as an entirely waking experience. I remember not only the experience word for word, but I actually remember my thoughts that I didn't say, so anyway, and so forth. But uh, anyway, I just want to make that clear that, that um, as I said, if there was a camera in the room, I would have been asleep. But anyway, I thought I was woken. I was led to a room, left alone with the most beautiful young woman I could imagine. Uh, I knew it was the Blessed Virgin Mary. When I found myself in her presence, all I wanted to do was throw myself on my knees and somehow honor her appropriately. In fact, the first thought that crossed my mind was, oh my goodness, I wish I at least knew the Hail Mary, but I didn't. <laughs> And uh, the first thing she said to me was she offered to answer any uh, questions I might have for her. Well, I kind of wanted to ask her to teach me the Hail Mary so I could somehow honor her, but I was too proud to admit I didn't know it. So as a kind of backdoor way of getting her to teach me the Hail Mary, I asked her what her favorite prayer to her was. <laughs> well, her initial answer was a little bit coy. It was, I love all prayers to me. Uh, but I was a little bit pushy. Maybe that's because I'm a New York Jew, maybe not, who knows. But I said, but you must love some prayers to you more than others. And she relented and she recited a prayer. 
but it was in Portuguese and I didn't know any Portuguese. <laughs> so all I could do was make the effort to remember the first few syllable, syllables phonetically. And the next morning when I woke up, I wrote them down phonetically. And then much later when I met a Portuguese Catholic woman, I asked her to recite the Marian prayers in Portuguese so I could identify it. And to the best of my ability, I identified it as, O Mary conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. Um, I will say um, that as um, unimaginably beautiful as she was to look at, even more powerfully affecting was the sound of her voice, the beauty of her voice. Uh, and the only way I can describe it is to say that her voice was made up out of that which makes music music. And when she spoke in this incredibly beautiful voice, it just flowed through my soul, carrying with it her love and lifting me up into a state of ecstasy greater than I ever imagined could exist. Um, anyway, so as I said, she offered to answer any questions I might have for her. And most of the questions I asked her came from just being overwhelmed by the experience of being in her presence, being, being overwhelmed by the experience of who she is. Um, at one point, um, I asked her, and it was more of an exclamation um, than a question, but I kind of stammered out, how is it possible, how can it be, how, is it, how can it be that you're so exalted, that you're so magnificent, that you're so glorious, how can it be? And she just looked down at me almost with pity and shook her head gently and said, oh no, you don't understand, you don't understand anything, I'm nothing, I'm a creature, I'm a created thing, he's everything. And then again, out of a desire to somehow honor her appropriately, I asked her what title she liked best for herself. And her reply was, I am the beloved daughter of the Father, mother of the Son, and spouse of the Spirit. And the final, um, Good question I asked her. I asked her some silly questions, too, that were either personal or just plain silly. I, but anyway, the, 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 the final meaningful question I asked her was, okay, so this is the Blessed Virgin Mary. It was obviously Christ in the earlier experience. This is all about Christianity. Uh, and at this point, I wanted nothing other than to be as completely a Christian as possible. Uh, all my life, I had heard the expression, the Holy Spirit. I had no idea what it meant but I figured this is Christianity and I better get up to speed pretty quick. So I apologize for the way I phrased the question, but I didn't know any better. I said to her, so what's this business about the Holy Spirit? <laughs> <laughs> and, and her response was just to look upwards with an expression melting with love and say, he's his gaze. So anyway, the, the questions went downhill from there. She graciously answered them. She sometimes gave slightly sideways answers, by the way, like that first question about her favorite prayer. Um, but she answered them. And uh, then when I was finished with the questions and answers, she said she had something she wanted to speak to me about, and she spoke to me for about another 10 or 15 minutes. And then the audience was over, and I went back to sleep. And the next morning when I woke up, I knew it had been Christ in the first experience. I knew who the Blessed Virgin Mary was. Um, I knew I wanted to be as fully and completely a Christian as possible. Um, and I was hopelessly in love with the Blessed Virgin Mary. In fact, my first thought when I woke up was, oh boy, I can't wait to go to sleep again tonight and see her again. <laughs> and when that didn't happen, um, I said to myself, well then, it's gonna be at least once a week, right? Or, <laughs> once a month or whatever. Um, and, but by the time I realized it wouldn't happen again, that I would have to go through another 50 or 60 years of life on earth and die before I got to be in her presence again like that, the memory had faded to the point where I could face that prospect. But it was a grace that I had misunderstood because if I had woken up that morning knowing that I wouldn't see her again for another 50 or 60 years, it would have been terribly difficult to go through life actually um, everything in this world was so drab and colorless and tasteless and cardboard and gray compared to being in the presence of her love that it would have been, you know, a, a horrible prospect. 
And uh, fortunately, by the time I realized that I was condemned to that, so to speak, it had, the memory had faded to where, where I could handle it. So um, anyway, um, I, um, I knew I wanted to be as fully and completely a Christian as possible. I will say something. I, I didn't know the difference between a Protestant and a Catholic. I had never, literally, I had never touched a New Testament, never mind open a New Testament. I knew nothing uh, about the Blessed Virgin Mary except from uh, seeing Christmas crushes at Christmas time and hearing Christmas carols. In fact, um, when I heard um, Silent Night and it says round young virgin, I thought it would refer to the fact that she was expecting a child, she was a round young virgin. <laughs> I, I mean, I, so, I mean, the this, this stuff that I learned in this experience was completely, completely, completely new to me. And uh, something else I learned in this experience, which was behind some of my questions, was during the experience, there was a kind of progressive revelation of the, of the person of, of Mary. It's hard to describe, but, but she started out the experience on the human end of the spectrum. And by the end of the experience, I literally saw that all of the grace that flows from divinity into humanity flows through the Blessed Virgin Mary. I saw her as this like conduit, you know, this pipeline from, you know, connecting divinity to humanity and carrying all of the grace that flows from divinity into humanity through her. So anyway, um, as I said, I, I woke up, I, w I wanted to be as fully, completely Christian. I didn't know the difference between a Protestant and a Catholic. There was nothing I could do other than uh, open the local phone book and find a church to go to. As soon as I felt comfortable with the pastor a little bit, I asked him, what about the Blessed Virgin Mary? And when he answered exactly, <laughs> Uh, I, I later found out, by the way, the pastor was a fallen away Catholic. But anyway, when, I, when he answered actually somewhat contemptuously, I knew this is no place for me. And the other thing that was happening was there was a shrine to Our Lady of La Salette not far from my house. And I would drive up there three or four, five times a week just to walk the grounds and feel her presence and kind of commune with her. I still didn't know the Hail Mary. Um, in fact, it's not that easy, by the way, to learn the Hail Mary coming in as a Jew because I would like go to a bookstore and get a book on how to pray the rosary and I'd be all excited. Now I'm going to learn how to say the Hail Mary and I'd open it up and it would say, Hail Mary dot dot dot, Hail Mary dot dot dot, <laughs> Hail Mary dot dot dot. This is really true. This is really true. Um, I called a friend of mine who was... Um, Bernie Greenberg, guess what? He was Jewish. And um, very, very, very Jewish, but he sang in a, uh, whatever you call it, a Baroque choir. And so he was often singing these, these hymns in Latin. And I asked him to, to teach me the Hail Mary, so he taught it to me in, in Latin. That was the beginning of my corruption, Father. Um, <laughs> Um, anyway, I'd better get to the rest of my corruption. So um, anyway, so uh, I, was, I was spending a lot of time at the Marian Shrine of um, Our Lady of La Salette. The next winter, I went skiing in the French Alps. Um, I took a day off from skiing, and I went to the real La Salette in France. It's very high up in the Alps. It's incredibly beautiful. It's above the tree line, nothing but you know, granite cliffs and snow bowls. This was the middle of the winter. Um, and uh, I just went up there to you know, to, to be there for the afternoon. I ended up getting stuck there for the rest of the trip. And when I was there, I met an fr elderly French Catholic woman because we were all seated at, you know, tables together in the refectory. And, uh, and then when I got back home, she called me up and she said, out of the blue, she said, I think it would be a good idea if you checked out the Carthusians. Now, some of you do know who the Carthusians are. If you've seen the movie In the Great Silence, that is the Carthusian the mother house. Um, and uh, when I heard about the Carthusians, they're the strictest contemplative order in the church. They follow the unchanged rule from the 11th century. Um, they live in solitary confinement. They live in very strict silence. Um, they each have their individual cells that they actually never leave unless they have to. Uh, they have offices together twice a day. They break sleep every night. They get up every night at about 11.30. They go to the chapel. They, they chant matins together. Then they go back to bed for about three hours, and they get up 
for laws and mass, and then you know back in the cells, and they, in, if it, their work permits it, they work entirely in their cells. They get the one meal a day, it's brought to them, and left in the hole in the wall, so that they don't even see the monk who brings it to them. If they cross, uh, you know, in, in the corridors, they're not supposed to make eye contact. It's extremely penitential um, life. And, uh, and when I, she told me about them, I thought, oh yeah, because here I still, I had to have these mystical experiences. I had never heard of a mystical experience as a Jew. And I wanted to find out more about what was going on. I wanted to find somebody who could help me understand what was happening. And when I heard about the Carthusians, I thought, well, these sound like the kind of guys who might be able to explain what's going on. So um, she gave me the phone number. I called up the monastery. It was in south of France. And a monk answers the phone. And uh, I say, I, I want to ask, is it possible for me to visit, make a retreat there? And he said, oh, no, absolutely not. We're strictly cloistered. We don't receive anybody. But then he said, tell me something about yourself. So I start telling him my story, and I can hear in his voice he's wavering a little bit. So I say, uh, should I send you a letter? And he said, excellent idea. Write me a letter. So I wrote him a letter. He immediately wrote back, you're welcome anytime. What I didn't know was the one exception to never receiving anybody is if they think it might be a vocation. So, I get, so I'm, I'm, still, I'm still not only Jewish, but I'm actually still anti-Catholic, quite anti-Catholic. Um, I mean, obviously, I was pro-Blessed Virgin Mary, but I didn't know enough to know that I couldn't be pro-Blessed Virgin Mary and anti-Catholic at the same time. Um, you know, I had grown up with the, uh, you know, with the traditional black legends of the Inquisition, and basically the Catholic Church was the reason the Jews were you know, persecuted for the last 2,000 years, and everything would have been wonderful if it wasn't for Christianity, and the worst of the worst of Christianity is the Catholic Church, and so forth. I don't believe this, okay? But, <laughs> <laughs> but that, was, that was the image I had. So I get on the next plane, so I show up at the monastery. I'm, I'm this self-righteous, arrogant, Harvard Business School professor, anti-Catholic Jew, you know, <laughs> knocking on the door of the Carthusian monastery. Um, the, uh, the prior gives me a, um, actually, for the, it's a long story, but he, he gives me a cell, and um, he, uh, he, uh, there's one meal a day, and he tells me that he'll come by after, after the meal every day to see if I had any questions, you know, for him, you know, to answer any questions I might have. So I'm in this, uh, it's, actually, I have to be correct. It wasn't literally a cell, because I was still not in the uh, in, inner cloister, so to speak. Later, I, I moved into the inner cloister, but you know, the, very, the first days I was in a, in a kind of a reception uh, kind of uh, hostelry. I don't know what to call it. So anyway, so every day um, after lunch, he would knock on the door, you know, come in, say, do you have any questions for me? If I had any questions, I would ask them, and he would leave. But the thing was, I kept expecting him to give me the sales pitch of why I should become Catholic, right? So, um, you know, the first day I expected, he doesn't do it, he just asks if I have any questions and he leaves again. So I figure, well, tomorrow is the day he's going to give me the sales pitch. Same thing the next day, he doesn't give me the sales pitch, same thing the next day. Finally, I can't stand the suspense anymore. So the next time he knocks on the door, I just throw it open and say, aren't you going to tell me why I should become Catholic? Because uh, this is, you know, again, this was the image I had of the Catholic Church. Overbearing, no respect for free will, forced, you know, forced baptisms, all that stuff. And, uh, and he just says, very gently, he says, oh no, not at all. All I ask of you is that you keep your eyes open and be honest with yourself about what you see. This was the opposite of what I expected. Obviously, he really, he really believed in this stuff. He really believed in God. He thought that God was at work with me, and all I had to do was keep my eyes open and be honest with myself about what I see, and God would do the rest. So this huge brick of resistance against the Catholic Church that I had fell with that. The next brick of resistance that fell was after a few days, I started joining them at Matins every night between whatever, 11.30 and 2.30, and I would join them in the chapel, and uh, all these monks, they were, it was an incredibly beautiful monastery, you know, 16th century or something, these, you know, heavy, dark, walnut uh, choir stalls, 
and uh, the, it, everything looked w uh, like it would have in the 14th century or whatever. As a matter of fact, my job at the monastery was to scythe the grass with a scythe, and the, the handle of the scythe was wood. The scythe, of course, was iron. I was given a stone to sharpen the scythe and a little container of water to wet the stone, and the container of water was literally a horn. It was a horn on a leather strap. I mean, they did not change for the last, whatever, 500 years. So anyway, in the choir stalls, the monks had these uh, large breviaries that looked like they were parchment. They were about two and a half, three feet wide, two monks to a breviary. They are spending three hours every night awake, um, chanting the Psalms, and I'm looking over their shoulders, and what are they chanting? Oh, Jerusalem, should I ever forget you? Let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. Oh, Zion, no place on earth is as beautiful as you, and so forth. And I, I look to my left and my right, and I say to myself, these guys are all wannabe Jews. <laughs> um, and then the next thing that happened there um, is I was scything the grass in the orchard. And this elderly monk shuffled out to me. They weren't allowed to talk, so they sometimes took advantage to cheat a little bit. He shuffled out to me, and he kind of shyly said, uh, do you mind if I ask you a question? And I said, no, not at all. And he said, well then, if you don't mind me asking, what are you? Because we noticed you weren't receiving communion. You're not Catholic, are you? And I said, no, I'm not. And he said, well then, if you don't mind me asking, what are you then? And I stand up proudly and I say, I'm a Jew. And he says, oh, that's a relief. We were all afraid you were Protestant. <laughs> so, so, so you see the, the, the stages of this, because the first stage was that the Catholic Church wasn't this overbearing, human, anti-God institution. When, you know, when the prior showed this attitude. The next stage was realizing that the Catholic Church, in its truth, sees itself as, uh, forgive me for putting it this way, post-Messianic Judaism, the continuation of Judaism after the coming of the Jewish Messiah, that it was one plan for salvation divided into a preparation phase, which is reflected in Judaism, and a fulfillment phase, which is reflected in the Catholic Church and her sacraments, with the... Uh, the, the um, juncture being the incarnation of the second person of the Most Holy Trinity as a man, and of course, his life and teaching and passion and death. So it's, it's one plan for salvation, an overarching plan for salvation, from the, in some sense, from the Garden of Eden until the second coming, um, divided into two phases, a preparation phase and a fulfillment phase. I'm afraid to look at the priest right now, but I'll... I'll find out later. <laughs> but anyway, so I, I saw that through the Psalms. And then when the monk asked me that question and said, oh, that's a relief, I realized that, again, in, in, the, in his eyes, in maybe the true Catholic eyes, the Jews have not yet received the gift of faith, but the Protestants received it and rejected it. So, so I was still a good guy in a way the Protestants weren't. So, <laughs> But the, the final, the final uh, step, by the time I left the monastery, um, I wanted to be baptized. I wanted to be Catholic. But the final step was in my short time in the monastery, I could feel that I felt, okay, let me back up and put it this way. If anyone had told me beforehand the life that these Carthusians lead, you know, there are no sleep, there are penitentialness, no, no pleasure, no distraction, no enjoyment, no companionship, so forth. No, no change, by the way, which is a huge thing. Same thing every day for the rest of your life, you know, um, in the material world. Um, I would have expected to see a lot of grumpy, ill-tempered, bitter old men. And instead, it was like a crowd of kindergartners sharing a secret joke. You know, the, the, there was this joy and this, this, this almost like this, um, you know, barely hidden smile all the time. And I could feel that what filled their life with, with joy and love and a beautiful feminine presence was the presence of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And by the time I left, I felt, I mean, I don't know how to put it, I was convinced 
that it's as though the Blessed Virgin Mary is the animating spirit of the Catholic Church, and the Catholic Church is the institutional structure around the Blessed Virgin Mary. And so my love for the Blessed Virgin Mary and my desire to be as close to the Blessed Virgin Mary as possible naturally morphed into a desire to join the Catholic Church and to be in the Catholic Church. So, um, uh, okay, that was a good job. It was only 35 minutes. Where do I go now? Um, <laughs> the, um, okay. I, I, there was a lot of grace, needless to say, in my conversion. The Carthusians, um, they, 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 I, I'm, Sorry to say they don't, of course, they don't celebrate the Tridentine Mass. They celebrate the 11th century Carthusian uh, rubrics, which they have special permission to do. But you, it would be really hard to tell it wasn't the Tridentine Mass. Obviously, everything's in Latin. And, and oh, the reverence, uh, this isn't one-upmanship, but um, after communion, they prostrate for a half an hour um, before the end of Mass when they receive communion. And I remember, you know, I don't really know what's going on, right? This is this I'm very uncomfortable wooden floor. One day I'm prostrating and, um, you know, and I'm wondering what's going on and how long is it going to last. I kind of lift my head a little bit, wham. <laughs> <laughs> so there is a tremendous, a tremendous sense of the sacred, a sense of, um, obviously, of the divine presence and the, the, the reverence I mean, who God is, okay? Who God is all the time, but especially who God is at the Mass and in the tabernacle. They, they never turn their back on the tabernacle. I mean, they, they, they leave the chapel walking backwards. Um, as I said, they prostrate, um, they prostrate after receiving communion. Um, I came back home. <laughs> um, okay, it was very hard for me to go to a Novus Ordo Mass. I, I don't think I went. I don't know when the first one I was, but I but, uh, went to. But I came home. I, I found a, a, a Benedictine monastery not far from my house where I used to go to Mass. Um, it was probably at least a year before I went to a Novus Ordo Mass. Um, it was hard to get baptized, by the way, because I wanted to get baptized, and, but I wanted to be kosher about it, right? I didn't want to get baptized if I didn't qualify for baptism. So every time I came across a priest, I would ask him, what do I have to believe to legitimately get baptized? I never got the same answer twice. <laughs> Needless to say, these are Novus Ordo priests. Um, I got answers all the way from you don't have to believe anything, you just have to want to be baptized, to you have to believe everything the church teaches. Uh, then the first RCIA program I went into um, to be baptized, it was at Boston College. It was being taught by a Jesuit priest who was a professor there, right? It's got to be legitimate. Um, so <laughs> I'm, I'm, in this, I'm in this RCIA program. And, well, I don't know what it runs, about 12 weeks or something, and you meet once a week on Wednesday evenings, and you have a, a class on a different subject. So it was about halfway through. The class is on sacred scripture. Um, we're being taught by this Jesuit priest, theologian, and he tells us, you're not supposed to believe that Jesus ever performed any of the miracles in the New Testament. It was just a poetic form of literature in those days. And I got up, thank God for still being somewhat Jewish, I got up and I said to him, I wouldn't baptize you, I don't think you have the faith. <laughs> <laughs> but of course I had to leave that RCIA program. <laughs> And it ended up, it took about, I'd say, it took four years to, to finally actually uh, be baptized and enter the church and find a priest who could understand me and so forth. And, or anyway, who, who wasn't complete. I'll, I'll give another horrible little example. I spoke to the abbot of the Carmelite, I apologize for telling this story in a way because this is Our Lady of Mount Carmel, but he was the abbot of the Carmelite Monastery in Boston. And what he said to me was, there's no reason for you to be baptized. All God wants is for you to be a good Jew. Oh. Yeah, yeah, that was pretty bad. Um, but anyway, so it took a while. As I said, it took four years, but I entered the Catholic Church. So, you know, within, I don't know when it was, but maybe a week after my baptism, I go to my first confession. 
and I confessed what I wanted to confess. And then the priest asked me very kindly, he says, what about Sunday Mass, son? Have you ever missed Sunday Mass? And I said, oh, Father, I never go on Sundays. I can't stand it. I go every other day of the week. Because, because like in a normal Novus Order church, the people who go during the week are there on purpose and are somewhat reverent and in tune with what's going on. And on Sundays, it was where I was, it was just a zoo. Anyway, so I said, I never go, I go every other week, day of the week. And he very kindly said, I'm, a, I'm afraid it doesn't work that way. <laughs> so anyway, but then I, I had found this, uh, this um, Benedictine place. So let me kind of segue into the, um, the other thing. So as a Jew coming into the Catholic Church, Judaism is, uh, actually for this I may even find some notes. Uh, the, uh, yeah, no? Oh, the uh, opening, this is uh, someone else's notes. Uh, um, but um, I, I, have, I have them here. I don't really need them. Here it is. Uh, okay, uh, okay. See, the Catholic Church makes sense as post-Messianic Judaism in the traditional form of the Catholic Church. Okay? Um, look at Old Testament Judaism. First of all, if you want to understand Judaism, you have to completely... There, we're talking about three, I, if, now I'm going to call them religions, okay? We're talking about three religions. We're talking about the Old Testament Judaism, which is a pre-Messianic plan for salvation of God. We're talking about the Catholic Church, which is the post-Messianic plan for salvation defined by God. Um, and we're talking about post Messianic Judaism, so to speak, in the sense of what Judaism became after the crucifixion, the last 2,000 years of Judaism. And you'll never straighten out in your head anything about Judaism if you think that the Judaism of today is the Judaism of the Old Testament, okay? And so what I say wouldn't make any sense unless you see, you know, three things there, right? not two things. The Judaism of the Old Testament, it was entirely, it was, ar it was around the, um, the need for the remission of sins, and it was a around sacrifice and blood sacrifice required for the remission of sins. It was around the sacredness and the holiness of God and the tremendous reverence required in worship. Um, all of that, all of that you see in traditional Catholicism. I'm telling to say none of that you see in in uh, the abuse, I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying all Novus Ordo, but you know, some of what, most of what you see today does not reflect that. Um, there, I can, any number of examples. Uh, if, you, if you go into a Jewish synagogue, you know, there's a line down the, you know, an aisle down the middle. Uh, at the end of it, there is a raised uh, dais, like the altar area. And uh, in the middle, you know, in the, in the um, absolute center of attention is the tabernacle. The tabernacle has a light over it, which is not allowed to go out. It's called the eternal light. In the tabernacle, what's inside the tabernacle? It is the word of God. It's the Torah, right, dictated by God to Moses on Mount Sinai. It's as close as you can get to the, the word of God made flesh. The, the tabernacle itself is very ornately um, uh, decorated with a very ornately embroidered velvet, curtain and so forth. The Torah, the Torah, um, the handling of the Torah is very strictly restricted. Um, impure hands cannot touch the Torah, uh, which by Jewish law means that women aren't allowed to touch the Torah actually because, because, um, because uh, the <laughs> menstruation makes a woman ritually unclean and the danger would be that she would be ritually unclean and touch the Torah. And even, even the rabbi doesn't really touch the Torah. When he reads the Torah, he has this silver um, pointer that he uses to, to um, you know, note where he is so that he doesn't touch the page. Um, the Torah is processed around the synagogue on festivals, and um, it looks like a Eucharistic procession. You know, it's, it's held aloft. And everybody wants to venerate the Torah, um, sort of like kiss the Torah, but they're not to touch it. So they take the ritual fringe of their garment, you know, the talus, 
and they touch the ritual fringe of the Torah and then kiss it. Again, the sense of the sacred, the sense of the separate, you know, the um, um, impure hands don't touch the Torah, um, non-consecrated hands don't touch the host. If a Torah is dropped, everyone present has to fast in reparation. I don't remember what it is, three days, five days, whatever it is. And the person who drops it has to fast for longer. And if it, when a Torah gets retired, when it can't be used anymore, it gets worn out, it gets buried in a funeral, like the Eucharist, if it has to be disposed of, has to be buried in the ground. Um, I'm trying to say everywhere you look, you see this, this resonance. You see, you could say a prefigurement in Judaism of the, of, of the real presence in the Catholic Church. Um, you have, now, this is getting a little, it's not really getting political, but I want to mention this. You know, there, there, again, what's gone on in Judaism the last 2,000 years is, is pretty bizarre, and I have, I think I have a 12 part, I'll give a little advertisement. I have a YouTube channel called Jewish Catholic, and I have, I have hundreds of videos up on there, and um, including a 12 part series, What is Judaism? And so I can go into a lot more about what happened to Judaism and so forth. But the, this, if you look at Israel and if you look at Zionism and you look at all the, all the craziness all around that, if you're going to have a hope of understanding it, you have to make the backdrop that before the incarnation, God was really present on earth in a unique way in one place, which is the Holy of Holies in the temple on, in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount, right? And that was the presence of God on earth in a way that was a little bit analogous to the presence of God in the Eucharist. So for Jews, imagine as Catholics, if the Eucharist only existed, only could exist, God forbid in the Vatican and Rome, sorry. Um, <laughs> but anyway, if it only could exist in, in St. Peter's in Rome, okay? And the only place the Eucharist could be confected was St. Peter's in Rome. And the only place you could ever get the Eucharist would be St. Peter's in Rome. And then you lost possession of St. Peter's in Rome. Okay, so that's actually the backdrop to understanding why, why there is such insanity in religious Judaism about possession of the Temple Mount, about Jerusalem, about the Wailing Wall, and so forth. It, 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 there was a prefigurement there. Now, um, Everything uh, for a, 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 when a Jew enters the Catholic Church and enters the real Catholic Church, he sees nothing lost from sacramental Judaism. He sees the transformation of sacramental Old Testament Judaism into the sacraments of the Catholic Church. Um, uh, boy, I, I'm actually, I don't know where to go from here. I'll just say one more, one more little thing, which is um, not such a little thing, no, I, I don't want to do that. I don't want this just to be a potpourri. Um, 1049. Uh, I don't see, uh, is it appropriate for me to take a question or two? Okay, so, uh, yes? Oh. Thank you for your beautiful story. Um, sadly, many years ago, my little brother, baptized Catholic, converted actually to Judaism. He's the opposite of you. He even sought out a Jewish wife, raising his kids Jewish. Um, so I just wondered what I pray and sacrifice for him, but do you have any other advice? <laughs> No, I'm sorry. I cannot understand it. I cannot understand it. I have lots of advice for people, you know, if, if the story was about somebody born Jewish, uh, you know, who, or whatever, or, but I, I, I cannot understand that. Um, and I also have to wonder what his relationship to, I mean, was he, was, was he really a Catholic? I mean, I don't know, but was he a Catholic in the state? I mean, I just can't understand. I mean, for me, this is, this is the best thing in the world. All my life, I, I had been hoping that I could enter into a personal relationship with God. And in my wildest dreams, um, what I hoped for was not one thousandth of what I have in the Catholic Church, you know, with the Eucharist, with the sacrament of confession, um, with a relationship with the Blessed Virgin Mary. 
um, I cannot comprehend how, and, I mean, if, if, he, if he experienced that, I would not be able to un comprehend how that could have happened. Thank you very much. Uh, oh, sir. Okay. Is that good? My question is, we just got back from Holy Land, and there was many places that we were not allowed to go to see because they were being taken care of by uh, Muslims. And I just wondered, why has not the Jewish people fought for those places? Because they're sacred to them, and I just don't understand that. Um, yes, yes, I, I, I agree with you. Um, the, this, the, um, there, there's, there's a tremendous split in Judaism and in, even more so in Israel. Um, Israel was founded actually by secular Judaism. It was founded pretty much by secular Jews. Um, it was founded in the, I mean, as a, as a state. It was founded in the aftermath of the Holocaust as a, you know, kind of like, well, hasn't this proven that the Jews need a homeland so this won't happen again? So it was founded with a kind of politi social political, um, you know, refuge kind of an attitude. Uh, the very Orthodox Jews actually were largely opposed to the founding of the State of Israel. Many of them still are because um, the Jews were only supposed to return to Israel when the Messiah came. And, and here, here the, the Jewish community was taking it into their own hands to return to Israel. To this day, I mean, you have a split in Israel. You have the religious Jews who think this really is about God, and you have the secular Jews who just want a good life and a peaceful life and a life among their own kind, so to speak. And the secular Jews have always held the, um, the reins of power in Israel. And the religious Jews have always been extremely indignant at the refusal of the government to uh, defend the religious content of the land of Israel. To the point where Jacob's Well, I used to always like to take my pilgr pilgrimages to Jacob's Well. Now, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? The first, they weren't even Jews, what were they, proto-Jews, because the religion wasn't there yet. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob dug that well. There's no doubt that Jacob dug that well in Shechem. It is the only well, you know, within, I don't know what, 20 miles. The, the stonework is the correct stonework from the correct era of that part of the world. That is the well that Jesus was at when he talk, spoke to the woman in the, uh, at the well. And uh, a Jew cannot come within 10 miles of it. I mean, in other words, it's, it's very sacred to us because Jesus was there, but it is like, it is like about as, you know, as close to the origin of Judaism as you can get. And Jews can't get there. They can't uh, get to the uh, oaks, uh, you know, where the angels appeared to Abraham and Isaac and stuff. And what's that called? The oaks of Tamar, of, of uh, Mamre, Mamre, and so forth. And yes, so the religious Jews think this is an abomination and that it's worth um, making trouble so to speak, in order to, to uh, maintain access to it. But the, the secular Jews are uh, like, we just, don't, we just don't want trouble. OK, you know, we don't run riots. We don't get, want to get condemned again in the UN. We, uh, I mean, the, the, there is a lot of violence in the riots when, when they try to enforce anything. So they just back off and back off and back off. Man, am I stupid to be telling this in front of a conference of women. But it reminds me of a line of St. Ignatius of Loyola. Uh, and he said, the devil is like a woman. When you stand up to him, he backs down. But if you start to retreat, there's no end to his fury. <laughs> we will look to end here in about, uh, our next speaker begins at 11.15. That's in 20 minutes. So we'll at least a 15 minute break. So we'll. Uh, take questions to uh, for five more minutes. So let's get let's let's be spatially equal here. We'll wait back and get a who's got a hand up? Oh, can I risk it? Okay. Uh, I'm really drawn to just the story of Israel and you know from its beginning. Um, 
the patristic era and then to the judges and then rising to, to a kingdom um, and then the era of the prophets and then the falling away. Um, and, you know, I, I see some parallels with the Catholic Church and, and the story of Israel. Um, and I was wondering what your thoughts are on that and if that's, that is the case in the situation that the church is in right now, where would that be in line with maybe where Israel was at some point? I'm glad you have to answer this. I mean, <laughs> I think we need a Judas Maccabee. Um, the, I think the parallel that comes, comes to mind is what happened at the time of the Judas Maccabee, which was that the temple was taken over by the uh, pagan king and um, desecrated, and uh, an abomination of desolation set up, uh, pigs sacrificed and an, uh, a pagan idol and so forth. And the Maccabean revolt came about to take possession of the Holy of Holies again and reconsecrate it for proper worship to God. Um, and I don't know if, if, if anyone else sees a parallel or not, but um, I'll tell a, a little bit of a story, which was uh, there was a sh period of time when I was good friends with Mel Gibson. Uh, it was when he was making The Passion of the Christ uh, and just after it came out. And um, he, was, he, was, he was pretty passionate about making a uh, movie about the Maccabean Revolt. And as soon as he told me that, I said, aha, I know why you want to do that. I get it. And of course, that's, that's why. Um, so that's the, that is the, you know, that is the me metaphor. That's not the right word. But that's the analogy in the Old Testament that uh, hits me most powerfully as perhaps a foreshadowing of, of what we're going through. One more question. Uh, what group? Oh. <laughs> How can I refuse my mother? Um, well, I, I, I got to Jesus through Mary. That's kind of a traditional path. Um, Jesus was a threatening figure to me growing up. Um, and uh, Blessed Virgin Mary could not seem threatening at all. Um, I suppose, like coming out of that experience of Mary, well, see, the thing is, I, I don't have a, an experience that really resonates with what you're describing of the other Jews you know. The thing is that, you know, I fell in love with sort of, or I, I came to know God very intimately in that first experience, but I didn't know who he was. But I, you know, I really loved him and I really felt very close to him and I, you know, felt this communion with him. And then I had the experience of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Well, she wasn't very threatening. She didn't make me kind of want to run away. And then I realized that that God that I had been loving for the last year actually was Christ. So... That, you know what I mean. So it just kind of got transferred onto him. But I'll tell you, whenever I tell that story, and even in my own mind, um, it's still Christ and not Jesus in a sense. In other words, the image of Jesus, I, I'm not saying this isn't theologically correct at all, but, um, but I suppose it took a while for the historical Jesus to... Um, merge with the second person of the Most Holy Trinity, so to speak, in my personal subjective theology. So I didn't have a kind of coming to Jesus at the same time, 
So thank you very much. Oh, uh, wait a minute. I still, a little, a little thing. Not because I, I don't want to say because I'm Jewish. I do have a book table downstairs. <laughs> I, I, I wrote two books, Salvation is from the Jews, the, uh, the Role of Judaism in Salvation History, From Abraham to the Second Coming, that's the theology part. I have a book, uh, Honey from the Rock, 16 Jews Find the Sweetness of Christ, which is 16 Jewish to Catholic witness testimonies, and I have a lot of other stuff, CDs and DVDs and stuff. But all of the media stuff is available for free. This is, I'm at least half converted, right? Is a, <laughs> is available for free on, on my website and on my uh, YouTube channel. And even The Salvation is from the Jews, the audiobook is available free on Formed, if, uh, I don't know if this parish is informed. So I see I'm, I'm selling against myself, but thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>